Hi, my name is David Howard, Director of Marketing for Bright Pattern, and today I'm pleased to have Ron Levine with us. Ron Levine is the CEO and founder of Accelerated Cold Call Training based in Oak Park, California. Ron has been delivering his Mastering the Art of Science and Cold Calling workshop since 1997 and has helped well over 145 clients in a variety of industries and thousands of reps across 29 cultures improve outbound cold calling skills, boost sales revenues, and get in front of decision makers. To this day, Ron still makes cold calls himself. Ron, thanks for speaking with me today. My pleasure, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Let's get straight to the heart of the matter, and let's start talking about some cold calling. Okay. Well, first of all, before we get into cold call training, let's talk about uh, cold calling itself and take a look at the word cold calling. Uh, it, cold calling nowadays has gotten a bad rap. It's, the term itself is kind of misleading. You can call it introductory calling or warm calling, intelligent calling, or even referral calling. But at the end of the day, somebody has to call someone they haven't met before, introduce themselves and their ideas, and both people need to determine if the cold caller's ideas can be of service or help the person that they're speaking with to gain a competitive advantage or avoid a problem or even a potential problem the prospective decision maker may, may or may not have been aware of. So the process over the phone has usually been defined as quote unquote cold calling, but what it all boils down to is this. Although this is a simplification, uh, cold calling or whatever you want to label it today, uh, whether it's done over the phone or in person, when it's done correctly and skillfully, it's simply introducing yourself and your company and your ideas to another person so that you uh, can understand how they currently do business, both mutually determine if your company can be of service to them, help them do a better job of what they do, and then finish the conversation by agreeing on what's the next step, uh, should we set up an appointment to uh, continue the conversation that we started? So, so back to your question of why cold calling. Uh, in 1995, after many years of cold calling, selling all types of products and services, from consumer electronics to industrial tools to software, I discovered and developed a, a simple, repeatable cold calling system that had consistently helped me get through to decision makers, of large corporations, get them on the phone, and then get them to agree to time and date specific action steps such as meetings or appointments. And the best part about this cold calling system was it was really easy to learn and easy to implement and also was easy to teach other people. So after about five and a half years for working for a major software company that was acquired by even a larger software company, I was laid off December 1st, right before Christmas, along with about 400 other people. I had just recently got married that August, and suddenly I didn't have a job or career, and I was saying to myself, what am I going to do next? I had created my last job with the software company as a sales researcher, and my job was to find money for the sales reps. That, that's what I did best. And I focused on generating sales intelligence before the word became popular uh, out of thin air. Later on, I was uh, promoted to the sales research director, another job I created. So when I got laid off, I did what I did best at the time, which is to find money. And I became a cold calling consultant whose job was to cold call on large corporations, find uh, sales opportunities, and then set up appointments with corporate executives. And after about a year and a half of doing this, a different division of my former software employer hired me as a consultant. And then they contacted me and said, by the way, could you show us how you do what you do over the phone? And then another company I was consulting with uh, did the same thing. And soon, uh, before you know it, I was in the training business, and, and I haven't looked back since. That was back in 1997. Wow, it sounds like being laid off was, uh, rather than being a bad thing, it, it led to something really good for you. Yeah, it was a real blessing. In fact, I actually shook the guy's hand, and I said, you know, as one door closes, another door opens. Isn't that true? That, that seems to be true for so many people. So let, let's talk about, and so I, I want to hear you too, uh, we use cold call training as a term, but I understand it's uh, more introductory, uh, you know, making introductions to companies. Uh, but let's, let's talk about the type of roles, uh, the organizations, who needs training on introductory or, or making cold calls? Oh, good question. Who needs cold call training? Very good. 
I believe that any person whose role in sales is to find new opportunities uh, or what I call find money, whether they're a field or an inside rep, uh, business development, lead gen rep, in any size or type organization, if they need to pick up the phone and call to find and speak with decision makers, then they need to learn the skills of what to say and how to say it and how to cold call effectively and efficiently to produce results. So me personally, I train all those types of reps from many sizes and types of organizations and industries across the board. I've trained everyone from one-person shops to Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I've worked with salespeople who sell complex technologies to those who sell educational materials to those people who are not even necessarily selling, but they're rather positioning their company to be recommended as a supplier of choice. Have you ever heard of one of those types of people before? Oh, geez. Uh, you know, at Bright Pattern, we deal with all sorts of uh, uh, folks in contact centers that are uh, doing outbound calls. I mean, it's all about having to pick pick up the phone for sure. Uh, it, inside sales reps, field reps, you name it. Yeah, in, in this case, uh, for example, let's say a printing project comes up for bid and a fine paper company wants their paper chosen. Uh, or let's say it, it comes time to build a skyscraper and an engine, engineering company wants to be chosen for the construction of the building then I specialize in teaching these people how to reach the people who have the final authority to make a decision as to which supplier will be chosen to do the project and which one won't. So it's not necessarily a selling deal. It's more of, you know, we want to position ourselves as the supplier of choice. So even though my clients come in a whole range of sizes and industry, they all have one thing in common. They all need to find money which I'm sure the people in your call centers all need to do the same thing. They need to get on the phone. They need to learn the skills necessary to be able to cold call more efficiently and effectively. And the bottom line is they need to ultimately produce more revenues for their employers. And that being said, also I'm a little biased because I teach cold calling. I'm a firm believer that cold call skills training is a must for anyone who makes outbound cold calls into any organization. Well, it, it's interesting, too, that you reference these folks who are trying to get themselves positioned. That's, that's work that sounds like it has to happen further back in the funnel than what people think of in terms of cold call training. Uh, you give the example of uh, somebody trying to get positioned uh, as an architect for a skyscraper. That, that's kind of w way, way back early before, you know, what most people think of cold call training is here, I've got a product, you want to buy it. Yeah, it is kind of unusual, and it, it, it kind of caught me off guard when I was first asked to teach people how to do it. But in reality, it is cold calling. You still have to introduce yourself, and you have to convince them to choose you as a supplier of choice when it comes down to you know making a decision who's going to be the supplier or who's going to build the building or who's going to supply the paper for the annual reports. And you've got to get in there and start building a relationship with a decision maker, and that's a cold call. Sure, sure. So can you, you've kind of given a couple examples. Can you tell me a little more about, this is looking the other way, you've given some examples of who you've worked with and also who you've called into, but can you tell me some more about the types of environments or companies that you've either cold called into yourself or you've coached environments on, on how to reach out to and introduce yourselves to? Sure, Dave. I've called into, you know, like I said before, many different types and sizes of companies in a variety of industries. And as I've said, they all have one similar challenge in common, which is how can we do more with what we have or how can we help businesses gain uh, a competitive advantage or avoid a problem or potential problem. And here's the real news flash for uh, sales reps and people that are doing cold calling is that our prospects in particular don't care about anyone but themselves or their company. So we as sales reps need to use the word you, your, and your company as much as possible when it comes time to developing our sales messages for our prospects. And our sales messages need to speak to and be all about the person who is receiving it because in all honesty, they don't really care about us. You may have heard this before, and it's true. First and foremost, prospects are concerned about what's in it for them and their company. So don't beat around the bush. Get to the point. 
tell them what they want to hear, and once you've gotten their attention, explain how you can help them avoid the pain of taking the wrong action or inaction, what I call the business impact, or how you can help them gain a competitive advantage in the marketplace. So if I can just recap what you're saying, there, there's a consistent theme across pretty much anybody you might be cold calling into is that the prospect you're trying to reach really needs to hear what the message is, you know, how does, how does it impact me, what's in it for me? That, that seems to be something consistent no matter who you're calling into. That's exactly it. In, in class I use the, the example, I don't care about your mother, your sister, your brother, your dog. I care about me and what's in it for my company and what's my favorite subject? Myself. <laughs> so I want to talk. I want you to talk about me and my company. And unfortunately, that's the truth. Sure. That, that's what people care about most. So if you start talking about your products and your company, you're going to turn them off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hear that. Now, what about um, people who have uh, reluctance to cold call? I know some people uh, they might even you know get kind of cold call blocked or, or just a, a general fear or reluctance to pick up the phone. Can you talk about that and help people overcome it? Sure. Um, Dave, that's a really good subject. Uh, cold calling fear and reluctance is, is kind of complicated because it requires that we think differently about what's taking place in our minds right after the call we've made, right after when we've made a call and it doesn't match the outcome that we expected. So it might be a scenario where we hang up the phone and we begin to think, hey, that call I just made was really terrible. And I thought I said the right words the right way and in the right order. Or I could be thinking, I said the words just like they told me to say, but how come I didn't get the appointment? Or what did I do wrong? And then we start thinking to ourselves, not only must I have said or done the wrong thing, but I'm afraid to do it again because I might think that those terrible thoughts are going to happen again. And therefore, I'm reluctant to pick up the phone and make the next call. And I don't want those same thoughts to enter my mind all over again, because then I'll think I'm, I'll feel even worse. So now the self-talk's going in our mind is making us think and feel even worse, and on and on goes into a negative spiral. More fear, more reluctance, more bad thinking, and the end result is less and less calls. So really, the solution to cold calling reluctance and fear is to stop and break that negative thinking right away. So instead of saying, hey, that call I made was just terrible, I thought I said the right words the right way in the right order, or the thinking could be, I said the words just like they told me to, how come I didn't get the appointment, or what did I say or do wrong? We need to stop and think to ourselves, what could I have said differently or better that have made that call better, followed by, why don't I try saying something differently on the next call and see what happens? gee, that could be kind of fun. I might learn something new, you know, something new that works. And now you kind of turn cold calling into a game, type of game, where each call becomes a learning experience, and it becomes a whole new, different way of looking at each call. So when I'm cold calling, I like to see how much information I can get on every call. That's part of the game that I play. If the call doesn't quite work out as planned, I can still say to myself, you know, it wasn't a total loss. Look at how much information I collected. And now let me get to the next call to see how much better I can do if I tweak what I say and the game continues. And I think that's a really good way to handle fear and rejection, which is to say to yourself, okay, that call didn't go as planned. Now what can I say to improve upon you know, the next call? What can I say differently? And then challenge your mind to find ways to improve what you say next time rather than think about the rejection that you experienced because the call just didn't work out as you planned. So in essence, what you're doing is you're reframing in your mind how you feel about each bad call as an opportunity for improvement to make the next call better. And therefore, there's no room for fear or rejection. You simply move on and place the next call knowing that you'll do better or learn something. Does that make sense? It does. And if I can try to sum it up, it, it sounds like the, the representative making the calls really has the power uh, within themselves to either talk themselves out of reluctance or talk themselves into continued fear to make the next call. That's exactly it. You summed it up right. Now, you, in your material, you also talk about call tracks, and you mentioned a little bit earlier that opening value statement. Tell us how that makes a difference and how you see that working. Well, 
you know, if you think about it, Dave, when an actor does a movie, what do they use? They use a script, right, or a guide. Yep. And why? Because if they didn't, there'd be chaos, and the movie would turn out terrible. So even though some movies use scripts and they still turn out terrible, <laughs> uh, a script or what I call a cold calling conversational guide is designed to provide the reps with exactly what to say to whom and also what to say in different situations should the call move in different directions. So really uh, scripts or guides or tracks, I call them tracks because you can move up and down the track and a guide kind of gives you a general direction but doesn't tell you exactly what you have to say. They're a necessary means of making sure your cold call comes off as planned and begins to meet the objectives that you decided upon prior to placing the call. Does that, that make sense? It does, it does. And, and that opening value statement, I mean that, that's part of the script I gather. Yeah, the opening value statement is uh, basically this is who I am. Uh, this is what we do. If this is a good time to speak, what I'd like to do is to learn how you do business, find out what's important to you, to see if there's a need to do business, and how I can help you do business better. Got it. Got it. And again, I know you're you're focused on uh, outbound, but your material also talks about what you call those inbound lead time wasters. I guess I guess those are folks that that come in and you have to have to call them back. Yeah, uh, there's two, two real types, and although I don't deal with inbound leads very much because, like you said, my training, the uh, live cold call training focuses on outbound cold calling, I do recommend the reps call the inbound lead after they've had a chance to do some homework on the person who inquired about their company. And so basically, you got to be very careful about how you handle inbound leads because some can be time wasters and others can be legitimate leads and you never know who has the decision makers ear or even if it's one of the decision makers themselves who's part of a committee that is the person who's inquiring so the other part of the equation depends on if the inbound lead who's hitting your website and filling out a form or if they're just calling into your company and transferred directly to you because you're in sales and they're requesting information on your products and services both are still somewhat cold calls in the fact that you never met the person before. However, at least you know a little bit more about the person who's filled out the form and have more time to prepare and study up. But either way, you can start by asking uh, a set of questions that you have prepared in, the, in advance. And there are some basic questions such as what is their need, problem, challenge, or what people call pain. Um, and in essence, what prompted their, their inquiry and then you need to understand if that inquiry fits into your target market. Uh, if they're a tiny company and you work with huge companies, then they're probably not a good fit for you. And to spend a lot of time with them would be a, a waste of time. So you need to see if they match up with what your company provides. And if not, refer them to somebody who can help them and save both your time and theirs. So on the other hand, if there is a fit, then you need to listen to why they inquired and begin to explore with them exactly what is the need, how urgent is it, and if they're willing to act now. So we, we make a, if we make it past those few steps, then we get into, okay, who's the final decision maker or decision makers if there's a committee? Uh, what's, if necessary, are the timing involved for the evaluation or the decision making or the implementation? Has budget been put aside for the acquisition? Uh, as it orders their access to budget from another department. And then finally, if, it, if it's in case of a technology sale, do they have the right technology in place? Like you can't have Windows 3.1 to run mainframe software. Uh, so the best way to handle inbound leads is tread very cautiously, uh, get them comfortable, like I've said before, is by concentrating on them, what they do, why they inquired, and why they think you can help them. And then what you do is you ask one question at a time. I see this happen a lot where reps ask multiple questions at one time and it overloads the person. They don't know which one to answer first and they get frustrated and defensive. So the secret is what I call QAFQ. Ask a question, stop, wait for a complete answer, then feedback what you heard, then ask your next question. 
you have to wait for a complete answer because you don't know if you start talking too soon, you step on part of their answer that might be really important. Mm -hmm. So if you have to, put your finger over your mouth, even though you're on the mm -hmm. phone, so you can't talk. So you got to train yourself to really stop and concentrate and wait and pause for the full answer and then feedback what you, you, what you said before asking your next question. And just very quickly, I want to come back to that case where it, it's, it's not a fit. And, and you're encouraging people to make sure to refer the prospect to, to a company that can help. Do you see that uh, paying back in the longer term, even though, Mr. Customer, I can't serve your, your business needs right now? I hope that you'll, you'll remember that I directed you, steered you in the right direction. Does that pay back in the future? Uh, I, I'm a firm believer in good karma. I think, I think that definitely pays back um, in, in numerous different ways. It's just a good thing to do. It builds good relationships. You know, uh, the the the, pros, the prospect or the person who's calling in is going to probably let the person that they go to know who referred them, and that person that gets the business is probably going to get in touch with you and let you know to say thank you, and then keep their eyes and ears open for business for you that doesn't fit their target market. So yeah, it's a good thing to do. Uh, let, rather than let you business walk out the door, try and help the person get what they need. Well, I ask that because I know that I've been on the customer side many times. I've called into places trying to find a product or service, and I've asked the question, you know, do you know anybody else that might be able to help me? And the response has been, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I believe in going out of my way to help people get what they need. I, I you know, even if it takes a few extra minutes, I might jot down their name and number. Let me give you a call back. It's a quick internet search, you know, quick Google search on what they want, and it's just a good thing to do. It's good business. Sure. Uh, that's my personal belief. Okay. Now, uh, just a few minutes left, and this is your chance to this is your chance to uh, tell your tell your story in in great terms. Let's let's hear some of the performance improvements number. What what have you been able to do for your clients over the years, and and what metrics? And measurements do you use to demonstrate the value that you deliver? Well, without tooting my horn too loudly, uh, according to I get a lot of testimonials, uh, LinkedIn recommendations, and letters. And according to one of my clients, the year they used me to train their reps, uh, sales tripled from nine million to thirty million. Uh, another company said after I trained their biz dev reps, uh, sales went up thirty nine percent, and they weren't even finished with the year. And both clients attributed their sales increases to my uh, unique cold calling system. Uh, so another uh, metric that's used uh, is the number of appointments. That's usually used the most by uh, set by the reps who have attended my workshop, both during the workshop and after the workshop. I've gotten emails, actually, and, and letters from sales management saying, in the first week, our appointment volume increased over 25%. or I've seen 20 to 30 percent increase in meetings due to this methodology, or our call center lead generation performance tripled, while inside sales group doubled its results setting qualified appointments. You know, these are all very gratifying, and I'm very grateful to receive them. And I also get emails from past students telling me about the dollars amounts of, of the deals they've closed, where they used the skills they learned in my workshop, sometimes many years ago, and I received an unsolicited email the other day from a former student that said he got an appointment with the CEO that led to a six million dollar deal. Wow! And an, uh, yeah, it's a pretty good one. And another former uh, student left me a LinkedIn recommendation saying he used the skills he learned from me to help him close the largest deal of his career, which is a 2.8 million dollar uh, deal with a major insurance company. And so it, it keeps going on and on. In fact, someone from sales management in one of the top three largest technology companies in the world, I can't tell you who they are, but I can tell you that the company has three initials in their name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he, <laughs> he left me a recommendation saying that, in part, his, his qualified pipeline increased by 219% after my workshop. So again, I thank God when I get these types of recommendations and emails and letters. Uh, the, uh, another type of measurement clients use is how fast does the training pay for itself? What's the net payback period? 
and uh, so that's another metric. You know, one client wrote, we more than paid for the cost uh, associated with Ron's training in less than three months' time. One said we paid more, we sold more during the calls on the training than we invested in the training. And one said, I just wanted to let you know, uh, a New York City rep closed a deal, a $208,000 deal in December that paid for the entire year of training. So to sum it all up, Dave, the main metrics used to measure the success of the live cold call training is the increases in dollar amounts or percentages of sales, the increases of numbers of appointments set, both during the workshop or after the workshop, and then the dollar amounts of the deals closed as a result of the skills learned during the workshop, and then how fast the, the training workshop uh, pays for itself. So the, the lesson of all this that I teach my students is to constantly remember to ask for testimonial letters and recommendations right after mm -hmm. you complete the work for a client. I have over 55 testimonial letters on letterhead and over 170 recommendations on my LinkedIn profile from sales reps and sales managers who've been through my workshops over the last 16 and a half years. And so I try and practice what I teach. And I just I made some notes while you were talking, and I'm glad you summed up those those metrics. That's from the, the sales manager side. I also made some notes here. Uh, you talked about reps telling you about deal size. So sales representatives are, are measuring their own metrics in terms of deal size, and then obviously that translates into their commission check. Their reps have got to oh, be yeah. measuring that Most as well. Definitely. Sure, sure. Most definitely, yes. All right. We, we had a lot of happy campers out there. Yeah, sales managers are happy. The sales reps are happy. And, and those, are, those are some impressive numbers, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Now, we just have a couple minutes left. I want to give you okay. final word, any final thoughts on cold call training, or as, as you say, cold call is maybe not the best word, introductory calling? Well, first, Dave, I want to thank you for spending the time with me. I really do appreciate it. I know there are a lot of people out there in sales who think the days of cold calling have come to an end, and I personally disagree because as long as somebody has to introduce themselves to someone they haven't met before, and understand if there's a way that they can help that person they just met gain a competitive advantage or avoid a problem or avoid a potential problem, then there's always going to be a need for cold calling. Sure. Well, Ron, this has been great. It's obvious that you have a wealth of experience. My pleasure, Dave. Thanks for having me join you. And to all of you who are listening and cold calling, keep picking up the phone and being polite. Be persistent because you never know who will be on the other end of the line taking your call. Thank you, Ron. For those that are watching, you can learn more about the secrets of cold call success online at Ron's website at www.coldcalltraining. That's one word, cold call training, www.coldcalltraining.com. Thanks again, Ron. My pleasure. Thanks, Dave.